finished uh, talking about virtues list. And then last week, just one Sunday, we talked about vice lists. Or uh, we, call, we call the former one, Zids of Life. And the last one, Zids of Death. This morning and next week, perhaps we'll be talking about <clears throat> hardship catalog. Okay? So we have the, the virtue list, we have the vice lists. Now, uh, the, the hardship or the difficulties catalog. Some people call it uh, persecutions. It's, uh, I think it's timely because I think they're showing right now the, the film version of the book, Tortured for, for Christ. It's the story of the communist takeover of uh, Romania under Nikolai Ceausescu and the imprisonment of, of Richard Warmbrandt. Now, of course, it's, it, he died not too long ago. <clears throat> but in that book, it also talks about side stories or the other stories of sufferings and difficulties that Christians or the church went through because of the takeover of communism in Romania. And uh, in, in Eastern Europe, <coughs> the, uh, the churches suffered <coughs> when, when socialism and communism took over. There, there, I, think, I think it's Slovakia. I don't know what was the former name. Formerly, they would, they would uh, and I think in the Czech Republic, they, they would, the, the churches would gain or get their support from the government. Meaning if you are part of the orthodoxy, they will give you lands and then the ministers receive their salary basically from the government. When socialism and or communism takes over, the government starts taking away the land from the churches. And so Christianity suffered also. Now, that kind of suffering, I would say, it's not because of the government, uh, maybe part, but it's their own doing. The reason is, the moment they regained their democracy, they found out that they have very little land and resources, and the, the current government refuses to send money in their way. Because they say, well, you are a church. And so that was a bad lesson among, among churches that they suffer because they don't know how to sustain themselves. In America, years ago, under, under the second Bush, the second Bush did this uh, ridiculous thing called the Faith Initiative. It's ridiculous because that Faith Initiative is actually meant to... Uh, get federal money and course it through churches. Now, some, some churches begin to rejoice and begin to say, wow, the federal government finally is giving us some money because they are ignorant, they are not thinking. The moment the government gives you money, they don't, they don't give you anything, actually. They are actually taking away things from you. So during the Obama administration, they, they already started the process of qualifying ministers. They can't make it official because of the, of the separation of the church and the state. Since the Clinton years, you will only be recognized as a minister if you have an MDiv, which of course is unbiblical. But during the Obama administration, they started moving it higher. You need to have at least a D mean for them to officially recognize it. If you were following the campaign of uh, when Huckabee was running the first time, he was uh, being interviewed by this vile person. I don't know why he respects him. I, I forgot, uh, Bill Maher. That guy is very vile. And uh, he, he, said, he said, well, I'm, I'm a pastor and I know this subject. And Bill Maher says, well, which school, what degree? Because he doesn't recognize the MDiv of uh, Huckabee. Because the word during the, 
the uh, Obama administration is FWD Min. Now, that, that is part of the trouble. That is part of the pressure. Because that is not in the Bible. It doesn't say in the Bible that you, have, you need to have a college degree to, to, uh, to be a pastor. It says that you have to study. But that is part of the pressure. So some of the pressures that uh, the church is going to be getting is a result of the way we stand for the gospel. It qualifies under the topic, suffering, the sufferings of Jesus. The only biblical sufferings that we are told we will go through that is coming from the enemy is the suffering because of the gospel. The Bible used the term for the sake of Jesus. Okay? There are sufferings though. Now, when, when that happens, people say, well, all sufferings is because I'm a, a Christian is from the Lord. No. There are sufferings that are, that are not the sufferings of Jesus. They are sufferings because of our own decisions, our own choices. We brought it upon ourselves. Okay? For example, if you are an office worker, and you are testifying during, during office hours and you get fired, well, it's your fault because you are using company hours to testify. Now, in the sight of God, of course, it's not your fault because, because you're just testifying and you don't really know the events. Or if, if you are a Christian and you are not meeting your quotas and your goals and everybody knows you're a Christian and you begin to say, well, I am... I am suffering when I'm fired. No, you're not. You're always late. You're incompetent. You deserve to be fired. That's, that's the way it is. But, but some people begin to say that all sufferings are sufferings of Jesus. No, it's not. So what we will be studying today and possibly next week is a hard, we just call it hardship catalogs. Because, because, Jesus said, anybody who wants to live godly will suffer persecution. Literally, will, will have tribulation. Tribulation or trouble will, will be pressures coming from the outside. It's oppression. There is oppression involved. Now, some people say, well, the moment you get born again, everything is going to be uh, happy hereafter. Here, here, no. There are sufferings involved because... Because it's, it's, the, it's the struggle between light and darkness. Now I know that uh, the inclination of some is to appease everybody and uh, to be accepted by everybody. That is not Bible. There is always a distinction that God is making between the children of light and the children of darkness. So it's an amazing thing when some so-called Christians are trying to eliminate that. And make it a disco light, you know, so that there will be darkness and there will be light. But God always looks, when God looks at the world today, there are only two kinds of people. Believers and unbelievers. And, and the lifestyle are only two kinds. Lifestyle of believers and lifestyle of unbelievers. When we begin to say, let's accept everybody and and everything is okay, you are, you are erasing that demarcation line. The moment you erase that demarcation line, you, you, are, you are entering into the, the, the area of lukewarmness. And God doesn't like it in the book of Revelation. But he is in the business. You know, in the last days, the Bible says, God will, will send his angels and say, before the judgment is brought, mark those who believe. Somebody says, Don't, not, not yet. And so the angel marked everybody uh, who, uh, who are of the faith, 144,000 in the tribes of Israel and an uh, untold number among the Gentiles. That's why the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses doesn't, doesn't know how to count, you know. Because when they read 144,000, they did not continue reading. It says, and, and uh, among the rest of the world, you cannot number the people that, that was marked by the angels. Now, that is always distinction. Always. The Bible always makes distinctions. Now, because of that, the enemy, 
doesn't have any original ideas, okay? So the enemy began to follow, try to mimic God. The enemy is also making distinctions. Well, for, for one, he, he likes people who are lukewarm. He loves them. Because those are the people that uh, Jesus is ready to spit out. But then, when, when uh, the devil makes a distinction, he's also making distinctions between his disciples and the disciples of light. Now, this is his program. The disciples of light, he will begin to apply pressure. He will begin to apply trouble. So that from being warm in God, they'll become lukewarm and totally backslide. What about those who are already in darkness? Well, he doesn't love them. People think that, that uh, Satan is capable of loving, he's not. His disciples, because he hates all of his disciples so much, he already won because he's already killing them, destroying them, and stealing from them. Jesus, though, looks at it differently. The moment he realized that you are among the children of light, he blesses and protects and strengthens. But the moment you are in the lukewarm area, Jesus gives a warning and said, I can't do anything with you. Either be hot or cold. And said, I'm ready to spit you out. Meaning, lukewarmness, unless they repent, is going to end up backslidden. Okay? But for the, for the unbelievers and the backslidden, he looks at it differently. Okay? For the unbelievers, he wants to get them saved. What about for the backsliders? Huh? What about for the backsliders? Huh? If they can repent. But among the backsliders or total backsliders, they fall into a different category. It's impossible for them to come back because you cannot crucify the Son of God twice. So a lot of people who say they are backslidden are actually not backslidden. They are just in a lukewarm stage. But the moment a person is backslidden, very, show me in the scriptures a backslidden person that was able to come back. Anybody? Was Judas able to come back? Man, that's, that's, that's going to be a different Bible, you know. What about Ananias and Sapphira? What about the Antichrist? Because the Antichrist is also called son of perdition. Judas is called son of perdition. The, uh, the consensus is the Antichrist is a former uh, Messianic Jew because he's got to have a Jewish blood in him. And then backslid. Yeah. You know, in the book of Genesis chapter 49, if you will read that carefully, in the prophecy of uh, Jacob to his children, the prophecy on Dan is sure like a snake, you know, on the road that bites the horse's shoe, something like that, the horse heel. And in, in, uh, if you will look at the catalog of, of Jews who are going to be, there's a certain portion in Revelation, in the final restoration, there's the tribe of Dan. But there's a portion in, in Revelation when God is making distinction. There's nobody in the tribe of Dan. There was a period in Dan's history that they totally backslid. And they are not in the catalog of tribes in the book of Revelation. Now in the finality, they were placed there because of God's promise to, to Abraham. But this is, this is perspective. I, I want you to, to always look at how God look at things and how the enemy looks at things. Okay? Let me read to you a passage. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What, what persecutions I endured. In Lister, that's when he were, where he was stoned, if you will remember. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. 
indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, who among you here love the promises of God? That's not a hard question. Do you love the promises of God? Do you want a promise right now? Okay, read it again. Verse 12. All who desire to live godly will be persecuted. How many of you, how many of you here are claiming that promise every day? <laughs> now, it didn't say they are living godly, just desiring. But of course, where desire comes, the action, right? But the moment you desire to live godly, here comes the hardship catalog. You see? That's why when a Christian is saying, well, it's too difficult, you're correct. You're correct. It's too difficult. Why? Because he who wants to live godly will suffer persecution. But I'll tell you this, you will grow spiritual muscles. It, it's not that bad, really. And I'll show you from another reading that we'll be doing later. There comes a time when, when, uh, when you are living for, for God and these pressures comes in, you will begin to open your eyes one day and realize you have developed the spiritual muscles. There are still pressures, but you can smile at it. You see? You can smile at it. <clears throat> it's like... You know, well, it's like, it's like exercise. If you, if you have never jogged in your life, don't jog right away, please. You may think you are dying, you know. Uh, you start walking a little bit, warm up, and then walk briskly. And maybe jog for two minutes, you know. Don't, don't, don't overdo it because you will find that you want to collapse on the road. Why? Because you are desiring to be in shape. That initial exercise, you feel like you're going to die. Okay? Well, do it again. And then do it again. And then do it again. And then you will realize you have developed the stamina. You have developed the muscles. And from jogging, my wife sometimes will, and did you use the elliptical? Yes, sweetheart. I did it today. For how long? Oh, 30 seconds, you know. <laughs> and then that night she's, my muscles are aching. I was on the elliptical for 30 seconds. So last week she was very happy. She's doing it for two minutes, you know. Uh, but at least you had developed that kind of <laughs> muscle, right? Persecution is the same way. The moment people put pressure on you, you'll feel it right away. So some, some Christians begin to say, it's hard. Of course it's hard. You're new. Yeah. But the moment you take your stand, you know, I, I'm not saying you go out there and and go crazy and say, I'm a Christian, go kill me, you know, shoot me or something. You'll die. It's, it's not, some people are foolish. But, but you will begin to realize, and that's why God doesn't allow uh, any temptation to come your way unless it is common. Meaning, Joseph likes the term standard, unless it's standard, you know. It will, it will, it will, it will, it will come to you. Now here, from, the, from what we read, Paul is, 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 is saying that, well, he, obviously he suffered much for the gospel. That, that was, why, by the way, one of the promises of Jesus to him also. That's why he can write that. Those who want to live godly will suffer trouble. Why? Because um, like the other apostles, when Paul was saved, Jesus promised him, I will show you, Paul, how much suffering you're going to bear for the gospel. You persecute the saints now I promise you. Now can you imagine? Some of us will claim, in the name of Jesus, I'll be promoted. You know? <laughs> in the name of Jesus, I'll have a new car. 
I never read in the Bible Paul claiming a new horse or a younger donkey. <laughs> right? You will never find that. No, he used all of that. He never claimed God will give him a boat or something like that for his, for his journey. Never did that. Now, he used all of that. But he said, Jesus looked at him and said, Paul, now that you are saved, I promise you, I will show you how much trouble there is. Now, that statement of Jesus is something that people refuse to explain. But, but if we are looking for a Christian standard on full blast Christianity, that's Paul. Because God showed him, I will show you how much. What he was saying is, this is the measure. Yeah, this is the measure. So you're looking at Paul as a Christian, and Jesus promised him and said, I will show you how much suffering you're going to go through for the sake of the gospel. Now, claim that. Celebrate that. You see, we would like to claim a brand new house, new set of wardrobes and all of that. But Paul is saying, hey, listen, one of the promises of God, and we, uh, we, uh, we sing the song, every promise, I don't know if the Sunday school still sings this thing, every promise in the book is mine. Yeah? Every, uh, whatever, every it is, including the lines. Every period, every dot, exclamation point, you know, and interjections is mine. Now, can you imagine that? When was the last time you claimed that? When was the last time you are subjected to pressure to take a stand? And while you're going through that, you say, praise God, I claim this is coming from the gospel because I'm doing this as I live godly for Jesus. I, I'm doing this in obedience. A lot of Christians today, the moment they see pressure, they go to the gray area. They go to the lukewarm area uh, next to backsliding. Oh, I don't want to offend anybody. You know, uh, I hug everybody. No, I don't. You know, because that, that, is, that is just not Bible. You know. And uh, we, we, have, we have to realize that. Now we went through the virtues list. Some people are happy with that. We went to the seeds of death. Some people are not happy with that. So I don't know if you will be happy with this. Well, if you will not be happy, I'll just persecute you this morning. <laughs> and maybe it's longer, huh? Yeah. Let's, let's, uh, let's go to Romans 8. Let's, let's uh, look at that. Th there is a, a reward you have seen Joseph before, he was, he was almost, he hides his, his weight, his scale, weighing scale. He's got his own weighing scale in his room, he hides it. Because uh, he doesn't want anybody to see his weight before. It was 200, I think close to 300 pounds or something. I, I look at Joseph before, I said, man, you know, this boy is big. He will, he will wrestle me. And I, it's hard to move. You know, because he's heavy. But uh, he, he gained confidence when he joined the, the Air Force ROTC. And he was motivated. Yeah. He failed. <laughs> I know how many times he failed just on the sit-ups. Yeah. You guys know how to do sit-up? You, know. uh, you sit and then you go up. Yeah, let's, let's sit down. <laughs> he, was, he was dying on that sit-up. That was always the main reason why he, uh, he failed on the initial uh, tests. But man, he disciplined himself. He will... He eat. I don't know what he eats. He eats grape fruit for dinner. 
I said, what kind of human are you, you know? And, uh, and, then, and then there was a point he became like, because you know your body produces morphine, like addicted to it. He jogs in winter. So he developed not only the stamina, but he's no longer afraid to, to exercise even during winter. You know. He began to be in shape, except for one part I will not tell you. you know. I saw it the last time <laughs> we were together. Well, if he misbehaved, I will embarrass him, I'll tell you, okay? But uh, now he, he, he looks forward to it. He laughs at me. He mocks me now. You know. We will be jogging together and he will loop around. And I'll, <laughs> he'll look, Come on, old man. <laughs> he, he laughs at me now. You know, because he developed, he developed the, the muscle. Now you liken that to Christianity. When, when we all start, do not be discouraged if if a newly born again Christian doesn't seem to have the stamina. If they stick to it, you will develop that. I told you when I started praying, my sister started laughing at me because I will fall asleep. Did you, ever, did you guys ever fall asleep while you are praying? Now, don't, don't sin now, okay? Don't lie, okay? <laughs> how, about, <laughs> how about when you are reading the Bible? Man. You know, I will, I will, I will, I will, uh, because I don't have a table when I start, so I will be reading the Bible like that, and my Bible will get wet. <laughs> yeah, because, yeah, I will, you know, when you, <laughs> everything comes down. So immediately I'll get the blanket, <laughs> wipe it. But then that's a mess, yeah. And I never realized my auntie was looking at me. One day she could not help. She wasn't born again yet. She could not help herself because that must have been a very funny scene. Thank God there was no Facebook during those days. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have backslidden, you know, uh, from embarrassment. But one day she could not help herself. She was laughing at me. She said, oh, you think you're praying? I saw you. I said, what did you see? Oh, you, you, I, I saw you. You started praying and then you, you started snoring and, and, and you're kneeling down. People think you are praying. Mom, mom, mama th- think you are praying. You are sleeping. You know? I wasn't speaking in tongues either. I was snoring. Yeah. But I, I persisted, I persisted, I persisted until I can read for hours and I can pray as much as I want to. But that doesn't happen ever, overnight. The, in in uh, obeying God and receiving persecution is the same. Now, some people, when they exercise and receive pressure, they, they just quit. They give up. They never develop a spiritual stamina. Yeah. So some Christians, the moment your faith is called into action and you are called to stand for what you believe, they just don't want any trouble, which is precisely what Jesus had promised. He who wants to live godly will have trouble. They just don't want any trouble. They never develop spiritual muscles. That's where immaturity is. And the the danger there is you are going to enter into the arena of lukewarmness. Because every time trouble comes, you run. You you heard of that uh, Florida shooting, right? What is that uh, sheriff's uh, name? He's very popular now globally, I think, you know. Shooter coming, he hide. They, the, the news was, was also fake because they thought he was taking a position outside. No, he wasn't. You guys know that he was hiding. When you take a position when there is no fight, those who know how to fight, you know what that means. You are hiding. And they will not say it. He actually hide. He ran away from the fight. That's why it is. You hear the news, he took a position, a perimeter. No. People who know how to fight, knows the language. He did not took a perimeter position. He ran away and he hide. That's the real, real term. And some Christians are like that because they never develop spiritual muscles. Now, 
The moment you don't develop spiritual muscles, don't you ever sing the song that you are a warrior. Okay, you are not. You are a flabby police officer from the Philippines who eats donuts and do not pay. Okay? And the tummy is big. <laughs> that's, that's what you are. And so, and so there's, a, there's a language difference there. Okay? Now, what Paul then is doing, because in the book of Romans, he started laying out his theology of the grace of God and all of these wonderful things. You're talking about chapter 6 especially. Then you move into chapter 7, the struggles. And then you move into the first part of chapter 8. Man, it was, it's, it's, if there's a chapter in the Bible that you ought to memorize, it's Romans 8. You, know? you look at chapter 8 after, after uh, bringing out the mercies of the Lord. He started with, there is therefore now no condemnation in, in Christ Jesus to those who live according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Wow, you read that verse. Wow, you know, you, the grace of the Lord is being outlined phenomenon. And then uh, you go down, it, it talks about all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We memorize the thing. And maybe some of you, that's even your favorite verse. But we forgot the whole chapter or the context of those verses. So let's re begin by reading on verse 18. And we'll just call this confidence in the grace of God is a virtue over which a wise man truly triumphs. Okay? Let's start on verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, meaning he's still suffering, but look at his spiritual muscles. Well, I consider that what I'm suffering, you can put it that way, are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. He said, this is nothing. You, you, you are looking at, at this... Uh, at this spiritual giant here, an Arnold Schwarzenegger of faith that nobody can beat at his prime. I mean, you, you are looking at, at this specimen of a person who have developed such spiritual stamina, such spiritual strength, that he can look at being stoned to death, at being jailed, at being whipped, suffering shipwrecked. He can look at all of this being thrown out of Lecture halls being thrown out of synagogues, being persecuted both by the Judaizers and fellow Christians. Okay? He was, even some apostles don't like him. He was able to look at that and said, none of that is worthy compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. And then you jump, and then it, it goes on, and then you jump to verse 28. After having that catalog of events, he jumped to verse 28. And we know that God, I like, I like the NASB, causes. That's, God is the active participant of this. He causes all things to work together for good for those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now look, look at this. I, I jump from 18 and then 28. After, after uh, saying that none of this thing, suffering, is worthy compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. He knows because he said, because in spite of what our natural eyes can see, what we can feel, in reality, God is sovereign. And if you are living for him, God causes all things to work together for good. You know? Now some people take that verse and say, you say, I can't do anything, everything works together for good. You are so ignorant. Because you know it's not true. You know? But here, the moment you leave God, you, you, you make a stand and say, this is, this is what, what I believe is right. 
This is what the, the Bible tells me. This is what God calls me to do. And some events will certainly begin to look bad for you. I mean, you're talking about the story of Joseph. You're talking about the stories of Moses and David. I mean, can you imagine the story of Moses? It wasn't looking good. After walking in front of the Red Sea, he began to realize, where am I going? <laughs> and I don't know why they took that route. Because they were coming from this far and Red Sea is down here. They did not cross that way. They went down here. So, so I, really, I really don't know why they took that route and God led them with that route. But that's why the people were saying, why did you lead us here? That was not just a question of doubt. That was a question of geography. Because they know we should have just run straight east. We would, have, we would go directly to Sinai Peninsula and we would not hit the Red Sea. But God led them to the Red Sea because he wants them to develop spiritual muscles of faith. And here they are in front of the Red Sea. But because he who lives godly will suffer persecution and that none of these things, oh, that was nothing compared to what God did next. They were crying, ah, oh, we're going to die, you know, we're going to die. And uh, God said to Moses, shut up, you know. That's what it means. Stand still <laughs> in modern language. Shut up and see the salvation of your God. He put that fire behind them. And then a strong wind blew on the Red Sea. It's, it blew so hard, it dried even the seabed. They Who among the nations of the earth have seen that kind of miracle. You see, the glory that was revealed, nobody else will be able to testify. Yeah, we can testify. I got healed of this. I got this house. First generation Israelite will say, whoa, we walk uh, through dry land to the Red Sea. And the waters were congealed. You know what the word congealed means? It was frozen. So, so if, if you go to some, some museum, well, like an aquarium, you have this uh, fiberglass, you know, and you can see these. You have eyes. And I don't know what kind of, of uh, sea creatures they see. Maybe they see sharks. They see stingrays. You know, it's good that there are no Filipinos there. They will say, let's... let's Stop a little bit. Let's get some, some crabs or something. You know? <laughs> yeah. But th no nation will be able to testify that. But they have to go through. They have to go. They have to move southeast from where they were, where they were just to hit the Red Sea. But that's nothing. Nothing compared to the glory that was revealed to him. And then at the end, well, what do you know? All things work together for good. But that all things work together for good was because they were obeying God. But when they were not obeying God, they died in the wilderness, you know. Verse, now let's jump to verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? You, you underline that word, these things, because it's talking about sufferings and difficulties. If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? He who will bring a charge against God's elect. God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Underline that term, 
overwhelming. Now, look at this. I want you to read from the top. Who can separate us from the love of God? Man, so, tribulation, persecution, and you can add famine, beatings. Now, if you have all of those coming on your way, what will you say? This is too overwhelming. You know, when all kinds of stuff, stuff are coming your way, it seems like you're about to face an overwhelming defeat. Because you are being, the Bible is the term, beset on all sides. You're being beset on all, attacked on all sides. And when you are being attacked on all fronts, what is the feeling? We're going to die because you're just being overwhelmed. Now look at this. What you deemed is a blitz from the enemy. An overwhelming defeat is looming. At the end, because all things work together for good, it's an overwhelming victory. You see that at the end? It says, it says here, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Instead of being overwhelmed by the enemy, we overwhelm the enemy. Amen? Remember that story in, in Kings when we were studying that? And uh, Elijah, was, or Elijah was there, and I forgot who it was. They sound the same to me sometimes, you know. But there was no food. People were beginning to try to eat their kids. And, and the captain of the king of Israel said, oh, we're just going to die here. And uh, Elijah prophesied, and they were beginning to eat their babies. And Elijah prophesied, tomorrow, not only will there be barley sold here, it will be cheap. Cheap is only when there's overwhelming supply. And the, the, the captain says, are you nuts? I'm, I'm just going to kill you or put you in jail or something. You know? Because they were, it, 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 is, it is a looming, overwhelming defeat. What, what could be more embarrassing and shameful than eating your kids? Because you are so starved. Instead of look, you know how we look at our kids. We're saying, oh, cute little boy. They were looking at their kids and saying, ooh, leche de leche, you know, hamburger. Because, because of overwhelming defeat looming. Then these two rejects called lepers, so ah, we're going to die here. They won't let us in. We're starving. Let's march. Let's go to the camp of the Assyrians. Maybe they'll, they'll throw us some dog food or something. You know what God did? If you are hungry, how do you walk? They started walking like that. What, what did the Assyrians hear? Whoa! Was that the army of Egypt? They are hear, hearing a marching of a massive army. Instead of overwhelming the Jews, God overwhelmed them. Amen? You see, it's perspective, it's spiritual insight, which if you don't know how to use your faith and you're a coward, you will never see. That's why a person of faith, people will call crazy. Because everybody else is looking at their demise and their defeat, but he is hearing something else. No, it's an overwhelming defeat. It's an overwhelming victory. On its way. Amen? But you will only be able to see that if you have been using your faith. You know? But like that captain, he died. He was run over by the people because he could not believe any of the words of God. You see? That's why a faith person looks at things differently. A, di a, different, a different kind of courage. You know, you know why the uh, guerrillas in the Philippines continued? 
because MacArthur said, I shall return. I mean, you, you talk to, I, I don't know if you guys ever talked to veterans. I have. Some of them were members of our church. They were saying, they'll, they'll find, when they were in the mountains, anything that moves in the mountains, they'll catch. And, and they, will, uh, they will eat. He said, when they were so hungry, he, he said, they, they, they said, they were looking for, for snakes, and then they were looking for baby snakes. That's what they eat. And then I asked one of my grandparents uh, uh, who, was, who was in the guerrilla uh, force, I said, what do you get for water? You can't go to the city to get water. He said, he said they were so uh, in need of water that in the, in, in, the, in the rice fields, when they're no longer planting rice, the carabaos will, you know, carabaos are heavy. When the carabaos walk, on, on rice field and it's soft when they walk and they lift their hoops there will be water there they said they have straws and drink that huh? now some of you just wants bottled water <laughs> can you imagine the, the carabob said step on the ground and because it's heavy it will it will penetrate them. and when they lift water will come out and they'll have straw and, and drink it. You know why they were doing that? Because it was promised, I shall return. Oh, you know what, what, what happened after the Americans came? My, uh, my parents will tell me this. Some of these, these cargo planes will fly through the islands. And here comes shoots dropping, bugs dropping. They open up horm hormel corn beef, <laughs> Hershey's chocolate. And they say, there were plenty. And they said, this is what we have been waiting for. <laughs> and suddenly they're smiling. They forgot they were drinking water from the ground, from the hoops of carabaos. You see? Amen. And so there were dog fights in the air. And one of my uncles was so bitter against the Japanese because some of my family members were killed by the Japanese. He saw one Japanese zero uh, shot down by an American plane and the Japanese soldier, pilot, was burning. <clears throat> Not uncle. My grandfather took a knife, sliced the thigh, and ate it. I said, what? He said, because of hatred, you know. I, I don't do that, okay? Just telling a story, but uh, but the overwhelm it, it looks like it's an overwhelming defeat. It turned out the plan of God is different. It's an overwhelming victory. Oh, if you if we will only endure, <laughs> do the right thing. Obey God. Develop your spiritual muscles. The enemy think he's bringing down on you overwhelming defeat. Oh, no, no. God is preparing for you an overwhelming victory. By the way, the reason why he cannot give that overwhelming victory right now, he'll just lose it. Because it takes spiritual muscles to handle those victories. If you are not prepared, like, like some people who receive this and receive that, like, like you spoil your kid with, with blessings, they're not ready for it. They don't have the, the muscles to handle that. Examples, you're looking at the Walgreens family, the Woolworths, you know, they, but then you look at the Kennedys, the Rockefellers, they prepare their kids to handle wealth. And so they can handle it. Whereas the Walgreens, the Woolworths, none. They're not prepared for that. Amen. So the sufferings of the present time are not worthy compared to the glory that shall be revealed to us. It is being revealed to us. We will never get to see this glory unless we persevere and we endure. Paul indicates surety in his statement. He's not saying, well, maybe... Maybe if we persist, you know, maybe 
if, if we persist, we may win. We may win. I'm, uh, I'm having difficulty getting rid of my flabbiness in the center, you know. And I'm doing, I'm doing exercises. I said, man, before it's, it's, when I was younger, it's easier, yeah? You get older, they persevere, man. Yeah. And people are seeing the glory. <laughs> but they just persevere. When I was younger, it's, it's, it's easy. You, you do a lot of sit-ups and twists, and it's gone. Play basketball, it's gone. Get older. So I was telling my wife, maybe I should look into, into a torch, you know, that will burn this thing. So I was looking at uh, some medication. And I, you have to read, you know. And I was reading this. And it says, it will, it will burn your fats and preserve your lean muscles. Oh, a, you look at the price. Whoa, look at this price. If you're, if you're stupid, you'll just buy it. You, know? you have to read. The advertisement is so promising. And then you read. It says, maybe it will. Oh, no, no, no. That's not a promise. Garbage, you know, with all of them. Maybe it will. It just makes me upset. So I told my wife, you go find something for me. Huh? Because my wife, my wife will, will read through that thing. You don't like that. Maybe. Here, it's a surety of promise. Nothing that shall be revealed to us. It's a surety. You see? There, there is certainty in this promise that if we endure, the glory that shall be revealed to us will wipe away our tears. Now, don't you read that in Revelation? It will wipe away our tears. I mean, does Jesus have a handkerchief? And then people, oh, I heard some pastors preach, oh, can you imagine Jesus with his handkerchief? He'll look at you and wake up, you know, and, and, and wipe, wipe the tears. It's not going to be like that. You, you open your eyes in heaven, that glory will erase the past. I'll give you a sample. Us who grew up in the Philippines under poverty. We laugh at those things when we remember them. Why? We are here now. We can eat better here, right? So, yeah, we, we went through that. We smile at that thing. I don't remember my... my, my difficulties in the Philippines and cry. Oh, I remember... I, I laugh at those things. You know, there is, there is no pain when I remember those things. Why? I'm here now. It's different. I drive my car, my car here. I have a house here. I have a wife. I have five great kids. You know, I serve God. I, I, that's, oh, but, but uh, when I was going through some of those things, there was pain. When, when God told me to study here. There was pain when I resigned. I mean, when, when you obey the Lord, God told me to come here. I have no papers. There, there was pain. And, and my friends, when, when, when my pastor hears that, that uh, they want me to speak, he talks to them and, and warns them. And so they get scared. They pull away from me. They all pull away from me. And so I, I, uh, I give them space. And for eight years... For eight years. So I, was th- so I was thinking when the Lord sent me back to the Philippines, man, I'm going to have to start all over again. I lost, I lost all of my friends. Whoa, no way. I came back, it turned out I lost no one. My contacts even increased. Within eight years, some of those students are already pastors. Some became bishops. I have more contacts now than before. And so it's a good day, you know. But that is, so now what, what the decisions that I have to go through, nothing compared to what the Lord has, has prepared for me now. If you lose sight of that and you're just living in the present, that's when you start making bad decisions. And he who does not endure to the end will not be saved. Because only he who endures to the end will be saved. You will not see the light of day. Whatever promise it is that God 
gives to you, it, it, it has alongside it living for him, living right. Remember what God told Saul? Man, if you just obeyed, you could have a dynasty. Your sons, that's what's in the mind of God. Saul, if you follow, your sons will sit on the throne. But he did his own thing. And so after he died, that's it. Nobody else in the line of Saul sat on the throne. You see. Because he disobeyed. The pressure from the Philistines was so much. He even went to a witch. Can you imagine? Before he was, he was preaching against the witch. He was killing the witches on his... On his uh, when he was being overwhelmed by the enemy, he went to a witch and consulted the witch. So what happened? He died. You see, he died. And none of his children sat on the throne. But that commentary that, that says, that Samuel was talking to him, don't you know, your kids could have been sitting on your throne. What he was saying is, you idiot. You're supposed to have a dynasty. You lost everything because of your disobedience. But he was thinking he was going to win. Why? Because he was looking at it from the perspective of unbelief. But you look at it from the perspective of faith. You can face Goliath. You see? People thought he was crazy. Are you nuts? Goliath will overwhelm, will overwhelm you. They were saying, no, God will overwhelm him. By the way, God did not even overwhelm him. You know why? It did not rain hail on Goliath. You know what rained on him? One stone. <laughs> if, God, if God overwhelmed him, a mountain could have dropped on him. That wasn't even an overwhelming victory. People thought it was. No, it was just one stone. And then David forgot to bring his sword. He said, can I borrow your sword? <laughs> and so, all things work together for good. And then, of course, in verse 20 or 30, the price of our calling was, was, uh, was itemized. Now, in light of all this, when we discuss this confidence, this verse 31, the moment you begin to see the plan of God, and God tells us his plan, like in Revelation we know the end, it will develop confidence. You know, there, there's going to be confidence. Yeah, it's, it's not the, the end of the road. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You know. Uh, I, I like this. It's, if it's not uh, painful, it's comedic. If it's not comedic, I don't know how you will react. You know, our president is, is very noisy, you know. He, he called this, this thing from North Korea the rocket man. <laughs> when I heard that, I said, why don't you just shut up, you know? Because that, I said, man, shut up for once. The rocket man. And then he went to the, well, I think it was in the Roosevelt room. He said, by the way, you know, I have a rock missile, missile button bigger than yours, and mine works. <laughs> I said, you're nuts. Every time I listen to that guy talk, I said, what is he doing? But think of, of it from the natural perspective. What is he doing? Do you know the military arsenal of the U.S.? He will drop two mothers of bomb and they will not even look like kids. That thing will be wiped out. He knows what he has. Now, from the, from the natural perspective, you really think North Korea has a chance with the U.S.? If you are an American and you're scared that North Korea has a chance with the U.S., I know what kind of American are you, you know? Even, even Russia is scared of the U.S. My classmates at Regent, 
who went to Regent after the collapse of the Soviet Union, said this. Part of the reason, <clears throat> now this is, of course, they said this, the street, on the street said, part of the reason why, why communism failed is because the Russian soldiers, the Russian military, got an intelligence information, the leaks, you know, of the military arsenal of the U.S. And they were hiding, they said, the fact that their nuclear warheads needs maintenance. I think their warhead is like a million dollars in those days to maintain it. And they are going bankrupt. And they could not maintain, uh, they could not maintain their arsenal. They had to give up. They say the strength of the U.S. is a big part of the reason why communism collapsed. They're finding their way around. You see? Now, it, now, Trump is just noisy and, and, and you know, you, you, he talks on television, man, you have to scientize everything. But, but the guy knows what he has. And uh, the guy knows what he has. It's just like going to a restaurant, you're going with somebody, you know, and he's, he's, he had put his hand in his pocket, trying to feel, is this a quarter? Is this a dime? I know that my paper bill are two dollars. But, you know, what are you going to order? I'm thinking, actually, you're counting. I mean, it's just like the store here, it, it, keeps, it keeps closing. You know why? Because the students of top eat there all the time. All their order is French price. You know, how are you going to survive with French price order? That's what, that's, you, you go there, we, we eat there some, some, sometimes. The students will overwhelm the store, French price. Yeah. And not all of them order. Two orders and everybody sit down. Yeah. It's, it's going to go bankrupt, you know. But then if you know, you have some cash. And you look at the rest and say, oh, well, whatever I want, I'll order. Yeah. Because you have, you have confidence. And uh, you, this is, I wish you guys will see this, the way I see it, the victory that is coming our way, that is coming your way, is so overwhelmingly ticklish. The sufferings of the present time is nothing. Compare the glory, it will be revealed. If you look at it from the perspective of faith, if you look at it from the perspective of unbelief, before you even engage, you're already done. Remember the, the time when, I don't know if you guys are alive already, when Mike Tyson got the crown from, who's that? Is that Pastor Douglas, the one he beat? I don't know. To whom he got the, the championship belt from. He was the youngest heavyweight champion. I mean, he, he beat the thing, I think, in one round or two rounds. During the time, you see Tyson, you run. I don't care who you are. I mean, I, I, I've seen him hit, like, like Foreman at his prime. I saw Foreman hit somebody, Jerry something, from the, from the gut hit him with the uppercut. The guy literally lifted from the canvas. I said, whoa! You don't want to face an enemy like that overwhelming force. So Tyson was asked, when did you defeat him? At what portion of the time of the fight? He said, during handshake. He said, I look at his eyes, I saw no carriage at all. It's just full of fear. He said, I look at him and when I saw him, I said, I got the crown. And sometimes the enemy will just look at us and say, I got this. You know. That's why sometimes the enemy doesn't even have to tempt us. Before the phase off, we're already done. There's no fight in us. You see? There's got to be some fight in us. You know. The enemy has got to be able to look at our eyes and they should not be able to stare at us. You know. By the way, I look at some parents, your kids look at you. You're the one who blink. Ask my kids who blink. We couldn't even look at our kids. They are already in wrong and they look at us and they got us at the look. 
They know we don't have to fight anymore. And so our kids run us. You should be able to look at your kids and they know you still got it. Because you look at them and you don't get it anymore, you're done. You're just touching gloves, but you're done. You see? In the same way, when the enemy looks at you in the eye right now, what does he see? Is there still fight in you? Or are you overwhelmed by the sight of the enemy? You look at him as an overwhelming force when God, through you in Christ Jesus, is about to bring an overwhelming defeat on him. This is what we're looking for. Oh, the moment you know that, that's, that's the confidence. You know, I, I don't mind James, my, my, my third son. That, that guy, I don't know what's up with him. I, I think every time I, my James see him, he sees a punching bag. I think his goal is to beat me up, you know something? I sit down watching TV, he will just slam his body on me. And, and I will laugh. And I'll, because he's, he's, he's small. And I'll tell James, and he, oh, he will just really push me. And uh, at one time, he, will, he touched me like this. Papa. I said, what is that? I said, you're like a girl, you know? So now he doesn't do it anymore. He said, Papa. <laughs> now, of course, because I said that, I don't say anything. <laughs> but he will, he, will, he, he will just slam his body on me. But because I'm stronger than him, I, I'll, I'll just tickle him. I'll tell him, James, I've got moves you don't have. And, you know, because he's still small, I can still squeeze him. I can still put pressure on him. Uh, I, I, of course, I'm Joseph is different, you know. Uh, when he was big, he was really big. He, he slammed his body on you, you could not breathe. <laughs> yeah. But with, with James and, and Joel, they hit me all the time. I laugh. Yeah, they're small. I can overwhelm them. How do you look at your enemy? How do you look at, say, that guy is a defeated foe. Jesus beat him already. But when he looks at you, what does he see in your eyes? Is there still fight in you? Or are you already lost? Huh? That's why nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. I like one translation. Nothing can tear us away from the reach of Christ's love. You know how, how, how sometimes, I don't know if, if you played this game when I was in, in, in Bisaya growing up. My grandmother has a store, and I like those pink sugar cookies. You know? I don't know why we always pink, but it's pink sugar cookies. I, mean, I remember, I was three years old, two years old, I remember. I, my mother wondered why I remember, but I remember. The, the old people, they have this stick. I'll, I'll go to her store, and I look at that sugar cookie, you know. And my grandmother will, she looks at me without turning her face. But the moment I reach out, <laughs> yeah. But you know what, I'm glad whenever my grandfather is there. My grandfather will look at me and smile. Sooner or later, the grandma goes to the bathroom. <laughs> oh, I love when she goes to the bathroom. Because my grandfather loves me, she will say, Jose, come here. <laughs> oh, he will open the thing. And here's the cookie. Yeah. Okay. And so I will sit there, you know, he may hit my hand from time to time, but I'll sit there. Why? The glory is about to come. When she goes to the bathroom, man, the glory comes, you know. <laughs> Amen. Well, we'll continue tonight. Praise God. Did you learn something this morning? Praise God.